I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I was reminded this week of a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a Lutheran pastor in the middle of the 20th century and one of the founding members of the Confessing Church, which was the very small segment of the German Lutheran Church who stood up against Hitler and who protested against the genocide of the Jews during World War II. And before World War II, of course, Dietrich Bonhoeffer made his name uh, as a theologian, as an author. He wrote a very influential book simply called Ethics, um, in which he, among other things, presents a biblical and theological and very um, logical defense of pacifism, of, of the stance against war, against violence of any kind. And during World War II, though, as things progressed, as he saw what was going on around him, uh, he, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, became embroiled, uh, along with some of his family members, in a plot to assassinate Hitler. Um, There were some high-ranking Nazi officials who were involved in this plot, and I won't go into all the details, um, but the plot was discovered and Dietrich Bonhoeffer was arrested and thrown into prison in 1943. He spent uh, almost two years in prison before he was transferred to a concentration camp and was executed just weeks, just weeks in 1945 before that concentration camp was liberated by Allied forces. And during the first phase, though, of his prison, uh, time in prison, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was allowed to write letters to his friends and his family, and we're fortunate to have many of those letters collected into a book. And so I just want to read a, a very short segment of one of the letters that he wrote to his friend. It was in late November of 1943. He was in a Nazi um, prison and he was thinking about the church calendar. He was thinking, wishing he could be in church with, with his beloved um, church members, and thinking about the season of Advent, which was about to begin. And so he wrote one of his friends, and he said this, Life in a prison cell may well be compared to Advent. One waits, hopes, and does this, that, or the other, things that are really of no consequence. The door is shut and can only be opened from outside. I think that is a powerful metaphor for Advent. We wait and we hope, we do things, but finally and ultimately, the door to our liberation must be opened from the outside. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot get out of this life alive, no matter how hard we try. And wouldn't you know it, though, that truth that the door must be opened from the outside, that we need saving, that we need life, not from within ourselves, but from outside of ourselves, that is the best possible news that we can hear. It's extremely good news. Now you've probably noticed the theme that runs through our scripture passages today. You, you might put, if, if you were to put one word on that theme, it might be judgment. And in fact, this fits with an older traditional scheme for Advent, where each Sunday of Advent was given a particular theme. The first Sunday of Advent was death. The second Sunday of Advent was judgment, which today is the second Sunday of Advent. The third, hell. And the fourth, heaven. I don't know about you, but nothing decks the halls with bells of (laughs) gladness like focusing on death, hell, and judgment, right? It might seem a little bit morbid, 
But before we write all that off and we go back to our, our joyful Christmas music and our tinsel and our Christmas lights, nothing wrong with any of that, but we are invited here to consider how considering these themes, considering something like judgment, might just be the key that unlocks for us this most wonderful time of the year. Our Isaiah reading is all about judgment. It's, it's a messianic prophecy about one who is coming to judge. It says that the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon this person, this messianic figure, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding. He shall judge not with his eyes and not with his ears, but with righteousness. He will judge the poor and he will decide with equity on behalf of the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the bread, the breath of his lips, and on and on. And this, this prophecy of a Messiah, of someone who will judge, of someone who will bring the justice of God to earth, only makes sense in the context of oppression. Isaiah was written to people who were not receiving justice, who were receiving the opposite, in fact, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who were oppressed and repressed, thrown in jail, exiled to a foreign country. And this is a prophecy of hope, but that hope is the judgment of God. The judgment of God is an aspect of God's love, of God's mercy, of God's grace. Isaiah speaks of a, a shoot that shall come out of the stump of Jesse. Jesse, of course, was David's father, and the, the whole line of the kingship of David is, is what this passage is talking about. The Messiah is going to come back to restore that line of kingship, that royal line of Jesse, the, the father of David. And so there's this image, this powerful image of this beautiful tree, the, the royal line of David, the, the beauty of Israel and Judah being cut off. The people are exiled. There's, there's um, just massive upheaval. And this is a message of judgment, but it is also a message of hope because from that stump, a new shoot will spring forth. And we go to the Gospel of Matthew, and we read about John the Baptist, hundreds of years, 400 years or so after Isaiah. We have John the Baptist out in the wilderness of Judea, and he is preaching repentance. He's telling people to turn around, to change their thinking, because the kingdom of God is near. And Matthew tells us that this is a... This is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. We're meant to go back to all those prophecies of Isaiah, the prophecies of a new Messiah appearing, and we're supposed to understand what John the Baptist is doing in that context. John the Baptist is not the Messiah, as he makes plain, but he is that voice crying out in the wilderness, trying to get ready, trying to get people to prepare for the coming of a new order, a new kingdom a new king, a new Messiah. And so all these people are coming to the Jordan River to be baptized. They're confessing their sins, and uh, among them are these religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they're coming for baptism, and John sees them. And of course, this is classic judgment, right? He says, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And we, we think about that, and we, um, I mean, it's, it's easy. In Christian history, it's always been easy to blame the, the Jewish people, in fact, and, and to call them the brood of vipers, and we sort of associate them with Pharisees and Sadducees. And, of course, that's evil, and that's wrong to, to blame Jewish people. We might blame uh, religious leaders. We might, we might, you know, well, you can blame me if you want. Um, 
You know, we, we might want to blame anybody but ourselves. We might want to see anybody but ourselves as the brood of vipers. And, and we might want to see anybody but ourselves as deserving of the judgment of God. But again, we're invited in this time to reframe our understanding of what judgment means. You know, I think it's true that it's impossible to flee from the wrath of God to come and at the same time, what John says, bear fruit worthy of repentance. The fact is, we don't need to flee from the wrath of God. And the fact is that bearing the fruit worthy of repentance can come only when we realize that the judgment of God is one side of the same coin as the mercy of God. And so John goes on, and he's, he has this really interesting phrase. And I, I don't know if you picked up on it. He, he's talking about God being able to, to raise up stones as ancestors of Abraham. In a, in a second, he's going to talk about Jesus, this new Messiah, whose sandals John is not worthy to carry. But he says this. He says, even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And what's so interesting about that to me is how the lectionary, maybe without even intending, brings together these really, this really interesting juxtaposition. In Isaiah, we have this promise that a new shoot, that new creation, that new growth will come out of the stump, the cut-down tree of Jesse. And then here in John, we talk of this image of the axe at the, at the root of the tree. I think this is a time in the holidays when um, many of us are, are caught up in the holiday spirit and it's joyful and it's cheerful, but, but also it's a time when many of us are not so cheerful, uh, when many of us remember lost loved ones, bad times. The holidays kind of, kind of consolidate all of these strong feelings, good and bad, and sometimes good and bad at the same time, right? And I think about this metaphor of this stump, of the axe being at the root of the tree, of being chopped down, of feeling like you are cut down with bad news, with terrible things happening in your life, with terrible things happening in the world. This metaphor of being stumped The good news is that it is precisely at that moment, precisely for Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the prison cell, precisely when we are cut down, when we are at our lowest, when we're stumped, when we don't know what to do. That is when new creation is allowed to grow in our hearts. That is when we can open up our lives to the transforming power of God's judgment, which is just an expression of God's love. I think our experience of human injustice, of human judgment, we've all experienced judgment, haven't, haven't we? All the ways that people in our lives have tried to put us in our place, all the ways that people have judged us and told us that we are this way and there's no way that we can change, that our place is on the bottom. All the ways that human beings, that our society, tries to make things right over and over again, and in the end it feels like we just make things worse. Perhaps we've been lied to in our previous experience of religion, so that we, be, we have equated God's judgment with that human judgment, with all the ways that we're put down. We think that God wants to put us down. We think about the wrath of maybe our parents, maybe our teachers, 
maybe the church itself, the anger and the wrath and the judgment of all of these institutions, and maybe we equate that with God's judgment. But our readings point to something radically different. God's judgment does not put us down. God does not cut us down in order to leave us there. God's judgment is about making room for new growth, for new creation. God is in the business not of destruction, but of creation, of transformation, of making us into a new people who understand the depth and the power and the majesty of God's love for us, that God would cast off God's own glory and become one of us to endure the brunt of all human injustice and all human suffering as one of us, to be in the midst, in our midst, during all of the suffering of this life. Because that is what God's judgment looks like. And that is what God's justice looks like. That is what God's love for us looks like. It looks like Jesus. Now may the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.